welcome to the fourth video of the June 2017 Algebra 2 Common Core exam. We're going to do problems uh, 25 through 32-ish. Uh, not so bad. These are the part two short answer questions. Um, let's tackle them. Let's get started. And before we get started with any section anew, we read the directions. Answer all eight questions in this part. Each correct answer will receive two credits. That's nice. Clearly indicate the necessary steps, including appropriate formulas, substitutions, diagrams, graphs, charts, etc. Utilize information. Here's the big part. A correct numerical answer with no work shown receives one credit. If everything's out of two points, you only get one. So don't be lazy and write down uh, and not write down stuff that you should, because that could cost you a point. However, if you don't know how to do the problem algebraically, but can use the calculator to do it, use a calculator, write down the correct answer, and at least get that one point. But don't lose a point because you just don't feel like writing things down. That's craziness. Number 25, and I laugh at this one because it, this is one of the most simple problems I've ever seen for a part two. Okay, given r of x equals x cubed minus 4x squared plus 4x minus 6, Find the value of R2. Okay, if I want R of 2, that means I'm plugging a 2 in for my X. So every X I have here is going to get a 2. I have X cubed, so I put a 2 in here. Minus 4X squared, so I put a 2 in here. Plus 4 times 2, so, or excuse me, an X, which I do put a 2 in there, minus 6. Notice, and I would like you to do this if you don't, whenever you are inputting a number into an equation, please use these parentheses, okay? Whenever you are putting a number in for a variable, use those parentheses. It will help. So now we're to the point where we've just got to evaluate this. All right? So let's take a look at this. 2 cubed is 8 minus 2 squared is 4 times 4. 4 times 4 is 16 plus 2 times 4, which is 8, minus 6, okay? I have 8 and 8, which is positive 16, minus 16, so they would cancel. So my answer is negative 6. Now, you have a calculator. I would highly suggest you check any work, or at least do this work in the calculator. Even if you do the work in the calculator, you still need to show your work, okay? And this is really rare. We have a second part to a part two question. Okay. What does your answer tell you about x minus 2 as a factor of r of x? Oh, explain. That means we've got to use our big words. Okay. So what does our answer tell us? If I look and I put a 2, okay, if I put a 2 into my equation, what does that tell me about this factor right here? Well, I should know that if I were to solve this factor, okay, if I were to like T-bone this right here, right, x would equal 2. And by the remainder theorem, the remainder theorem tells me if I plug a 2 into my equation, like I did right here, the output will be my remainder, all right? And if my remainder is 0, then this expression is a factor. If the remainder is not 0, then my factor here is not a perfect factor. Okay? So, this is what I'm going to say. It says, x minus 2 is not a factor. Okay, because they're asking us, what does your answer tell you about x minus 2 being a factor? Well, it's not a factor. Because r of 2 equals negative 6. All right? That might be enough, but be because I'm a little paranoid about the people who grade this thing, I would say r of 2 must be 0. For x minus 2 
to be a factor. And that is by the remainder theorem. Now, I probably wrote way more than I need to. But again, this is everything that's in my mind. Okay? Easy problem. Number 26 is a data and stats problem. The weight of a bag of pears at a local market averages 8 pounds with a standard deviation of 0.5 pounds. Okay. Average is the same thing as mean, which I want to use this little symbol, mean. Standard deviation is 0.5, which is this kind of symbol right there. The weights of all the bags of pears at the market closely follow a normal distribution. Fantastic. Determine what percentage, I need to find a percentage, of the bags to the nearest integer, that's the whole number, weighed less than 82, uh, excuse me, 8.25 pounds. If something weighs less than 8.25 pounds, that means it can weigh anything in between 0 to 8.25 pounds, okay? If it weighs more than 8.25 pounds, it would not be in this interval right here. This tells me in the calculator, I'm going to use normal CDF. I love that because in order to use normal CDF, that will give me the percentage I want. I need a low end to my interval. I need an upper end to my interval. Because we're telling the calculator the interval we want right here. That's what this does. We need a mean. Oh, look at that. And we need a standard deviation. Holy smokes. <laughs> we got everything we need. So, this will give us a probability, which is a percent in decimal form. We just need to convert it from decimal form to percent. So, where in the calculator is my normal CDF? Do, 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 da, 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 da. Turn this on, and I go to my distribution menu, which is blue above vars. So I hit second, vars, and I'm going to pick choice two. Normal CDF. I don't want PDF. <laughs> no one wants to pee. We just want CDF here. And look at all those things I said we have here. My lower bound, let's just clear that out. Yeah. Zero. I'm going to go right to the board and do this. 8.25. Bam. 8 is my mean. And 0.5 is my standard deviation. I'm going to paste this into the computer and hit enter. And I get 0 0.69. 0 0.69146. This is a probability. I want a percent. Apply that twice, and I get 69.416%. But they want it to the nearest integer, which is whole number. So I'm just going to call that 69%. And all you needed to know was where to go in the calculator to do that problem. Man, that was a nice, easy problem. Love it. Most two-point problems, okay, are simple. Don't overcomplicate them. Let's read 27. Over the set of integers, factor the expression 4x cubed minus x squared plus 16x minus 4 completely. So I might have students that say, what does this mean? Over the set of integers. Okay, let's, for one second, not care about this. What does the rest tell you to do? Factor this expression completely. Just worry about factoring the uh, expression completely. All right, that's over the set of integers is some, it's not significant to this problem, and it's just extra stuff that you really don't need to do, okay? So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor this by grouping. I have four terms here, okay? I'm going to take my first two terms and my last two terms, okay? And the whole point behind factoring by grouping is after I factor that green parenthesis, and after I factor that red parenthesis, what's left after I factor, I want to match. Meaning, I can take an x squared out of here. That leaves me 4x minus 1. 
whatever I factor out of here, I want to have 4x minus 1 left, okay? And if I factor out a positive 4, <laughs> it definitely does that for me. Now, here's the easy part. Now it's just a matching game. Everything that is outside my parentheses, my x squared and my 4, go together in one parenthesis. And these things that are left kind of mash together in one parenthesis. Ooh, there's a minus. Okay, I don't write that twice. And guess what? This is factored completely. It's a two-point problem, so it's not going to be difficult. And it was not. Some people might say, but this guy, I'll go purple. See this, isn't that two squares? Isn't that x plus 2 times x minus 2? Shouldn't I get that there? You are thinking of a difference of perfect squares, a dops. It is Dops, a difference of perfect squares. This stands for the word difference. Difference is the solution or an answer to a subtraction problem. That only works when that is a minus sign. If this is a plus sign, the two squares, like x squared and 4, two perfect squares, then you can't factor it. So I can't factor this. So no, it's not x plus 2 minus 2 because it is not a difference of perfect squares. It's a sum of perfect squares, but we can't factor sums like that situation, okay? So, my answer, written here in black, x squared plus 4 times 4x minus 1. Again, it is a 28. We are now on to a trig or an exponential. This is trig. I can tell because that looks like a cosine curve to me. The graph below represents the height above the ground, h, in inches. Okay, here's our height. This is my h, height in inches. Of a point on a triathlete's tire, or bike wheel, during a training ride in terms of t, which is time in seconds. Okay, so this is my x-axis, time in seconds. So, what they're asking us to do is to identify the period of the graph and describe what the period represents in this context of the triathlete's bike wheel. Okay, first of all, two-point question. It's not going to be that difficult. You just need to know what period is of a function. That's the length of one cycle of the function. All right? So, a sine curve goes like an S, right? Boom, that's one cycle of a sine curve. A cosine curve is the cuff, like that, boom. So it starts up high and it ends up high. So if I look here, I start up high, and I go, I'm still going down, boom, right there. That is one cosine curve. What is the length that goes from zero to two-thirds? That distance, two-thirds, is your period, okay? So my period, two-thirds. Bam. But they want me to also describe, not just identify. We did. We identified it. Let's describe what that means in the context here. All right. This represents the height off the ground. So let's do playful again. Let's put a little dot right here. Okay. This little bugger is at the top, the highest point, 26 inches. Bam, off the ground. As I move down my graph, my height is decreasing, right? Which means, okay, this is starting to move down. Da, 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 da. Okay? I keep on moving down until I get to the lowest point, which is right about here. So that means this guy is going to move to the lowest point. Boom. Then I go back up to the high point. Back up to the high point. So what did that purple point do over the course of one cycle? The tire went around one time. And that's what we've got to state. Okay? So what does the period represent? Well, what does that two-third two thirds represent? It's time. So it takes two-thirds of a second for the tire to make one complete I say revolution or turn.
return or revolution? Revolution. Well, I mean, you could say that a, a number of different ways. You can say it takes two thirds of a second for the tire to rotate 360 degrees. Whatever. You're good. You're smart. So far, we're acing this. <laughs> oh, oh, another easy one. These are gimmies, people. As long as you know just a little tiny bits of information, these are gimmies. All right? Let me explain this to you. There is no part two to this question. They haven't even read part one, but there's no part two here. What's it asking us to do? Graph y equals 400 times 0.85 raised to the 2x minus 6 on this axis. We have a calculator. Just put it in the calculator and look at your points. Not only do we have the calculator, they even give us the window. Let me explain. I'm going to start on the x-axis at 0. And I'm going to go all the way to 10. That's my x min and max when I graph this in the window. Every two blocks represents 1. So I go 1, 2 more blocks goes 2. 2 more blocks goes to 3. 2 more blocks to 4. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Okay? So my x-axis is going to go from 0 to 10 by 1s. Let's take a look at the y-axis. Okay? My y-axis starts at 0. It goes all the way to 400. So my y min and max is going to be 0 to 400 on my window. And if you look, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 tick marks with 100. Every tick mark is represents 20. Okay? So 100, 20, 40, 60, 80, 200. 20, 40, 60, 80, 300. 20, 40, 60, 80, 400. So I have the window and the equation to graph. I mean, we just look at our table for our x values, 0 through 10. There is no reason, no reason this should be anything but 110% correct. All right, let's turn this thing on, on, there we go, bam. Y equals 400 times 0.85 raised to the 2x. Now be careful. You see how my cursor is still in the exponent? I need to pop off there and then have my minus 6. So I'm going to look at my window. Okay, first, my window, my x is I went from 0 is my minimum to 10 by 1s. My y is going to go from 0 minimum to 400 maximum by 20s. Okay, now my window set, I'm going to plot my graph first on this paper, or on this problem. Then I'm going to show you the graph that we came up with. And it should match. Always, always, always reference the graph, okay? Look at here. Here's my graph. I know I said I was going to see this. This is what it should look like. It should start up high and dip down low. Don't just take a look at this and say, oh, okay, well, it goes like this. Don't do that. Come on. Let's not get crazy. You need to put the exact points. Here we go. Here's 0 through 6. Bam. But remember, I need 0 through 10, right? Da, 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 da. And now let's get, we'll go down here until we get 7, 8, 9, and 10. 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, bam, there we go. I don't care anything beyond 10. Okay, let's graph this bad boy, shall we? First one, 0, is 394. That is almost 400, so I right about there. Okay, I'm plotting all these nice points for us. 1 is 283. So 1 goes to 283. That's just short, a little bit above 280. Because remember, these go by 20s. Okay, 220, 240, 260, 280. So it's a little bit above there. 202 at 2. So at 2, I go just above 200. Right about there. 3, 144, that is a little bit above 140. So 120, 105, maybe right there. 4 is 103, so I go just above 100. Okay, 5 is 72, so at 5 I'm going to in between 60 and 80 to 70. 
slightly above there, right about there. Uh, 6 goes right to 50. So 6 goes to 50. That is in between 40 and 60, exactly. Bam. 7 gives us 35, so that's just below 40. Uh, 8 is just above 20. 9 is 15, that's just below 20. And 10 brings us to almost 10, which is a halfway point, right about there. So if I connect all these dots, I'm going to put an arrowhead at the end, and I really should label that. Y equals 400.85 to the 2x minus 6. All right? That is a beautiful graph. Let me remind you of what this graph looks like. I mean, that is great. In fact, I like doing stuff like this because I like techie stuff. I go here. I put this graph right about here. Okay? And what I do is I go here and I hit properties. And look what happens as I fade that out. You can see mine. Look at that. I mean, God. Oh, man. That baby. Will this move over here? Let's see if I do that. No, oh my god, that opened up so wide. Can we shorten this? We can't, no, it won't go any shorter. I would like for you to see the other one. But you can see that. Look at that. And that is dang near perfect. Dang near perfect. Look at that. Ah, oh, good. I love admiring fantastic work. And you, my friend, you're fantastic. Number 30. Solve algebraically for all values of x. Hmm. First thing that should pop in your mind with this equation is there is a square root. I'm going to have to square that, use opposite math to get rid of it. I cannot get rid of this and square it until it is alone on one side by itself. I need to subtract x to start. So on the left side, I have the square root of x minus 4 equals 6 minus x. All right. Now I can square both sides, okay? Square this side, square this side, okay? My square and square root cancel, so I have x minus 4 equals. The right side is not 6 squared minus x squared. Why do students always do that? If I have 6 minus x, that is like taking 6 minus x and multiplying it times 6 minus x. It is multiplying it by itself. I have to FOIL that. And when I FOIL that, I get 36 minus 12x plus x squared. All right? Now let's just get rid of this. Now, this has a stench to it. You know what it smells like? The quadratic. Quadratic all over it, which means I got to set it equal to zero. Booty cheek it and T-bone it, which is, you know, factor and solve. So, minus x plus 4. Minus x plus 4. So, 0 equals, and I'm going to write this in standard form. I'm going to put my x squared first, positive x squared, minus 13x plus 40. Okay? Oh, you're, you're welcome for this being so easy, okay? So, this is going to be... Two numbers that multiply to 40 that add to negative 13. Negative 8 and negative 5, maybe, equals 0. And there's my booty cheek, and here's my T-bone. Okay? So x equals 8 and x equals 5. But more times than not, okay, more times than not, you need to check your answers specifically when there is a square root or even a fraction because sometimes with square roots we get solutions that are extraneous which means they come out and work out algebraically nice and fine but when you check them they don't quite work they want to work they look like they might work but they don't I'm looking at these two answers and I can tell you right now 8 is not going to work and let me explain why let me check both of them First, let's check 5. Let's make sure 5 works. When x equals 5, I'm going to put a 5 in for both of these x's. The square root 
of 5 minus 4 plus 5 equals 6. Okay, so this is 1. The square root of 1 plus 5 equals 6. The square root of 1 is 1. I think you can see this is going to work. Boom. Let's try 8. Okay, I'm going to put 8 in. Let's grab the green pen. 8 is going to go in for these x's. So the square root of 8 minus 4 plus 8 equals 6. I said that I could identify that 8 was not going to work right off the bat. How come? Because if I have a positive 8, what do I need to combine with a positive 8 to get 6? Shouldn't this be negative 2 here? 8 minus 2 is 6. I will never get a negative value from a square root. If I have a negative value underneath a square root, I get an error in a calculator. It doesn't work. It's an imaginary number. Can't happen. So that's how I knew that wasn't going to work. If you couldn't identify that, you would have to finish checking this, okay? And we're going to right now. 8 minus 4 is 4. So the square root of 4 plus 8 equals 6. 2 plus 8 equals 6. Um, 10 does not equal 6. Now, I said these problems always seem like they want to try to work. A positive 8 and a negative 2 would have worked, but we get a positive 2 here. So, like, you kind of get numbers that might make it happen, but it just doesn't work. And when you have your answers right here, you better put a line or two through them like this. You might not have to label that it's extraneous, on the answer key, it just says, to get full credit, you've identified x equals 5 as the answer, and we have here. But because we're intelligent, we can label this as an extraneous solution. It did not tell us to label 1 as an extraneous solution, but I can't have 8 as an answer, otherwise you will not get full credit. Oh my god, is this a third grade test? I mean, how easy is this thing? Write the cubed root of x times the square root of x as a single term with a rational exponent. Rational just means fraction, people. So they want you to take this expression and write it as a single term, just one term, that has an exponent that happens to be a fraction. Why do they use words like rational? Why don't they just say fraction exponent? They used to say that in, what? fifth and fourth grade, whatever, sixth grade, when you work with fractions. But math people like to come up with more complicated words to represent easy words to sound smarter. That's what math people do. I mean, because English people, they sound awesome when they use fancy words. Like, I could say fast, or instead of fast, they say quickly, rapidly. They don't just say fast. So with math, we do the same thing. It's not just a fraction. It's rational. Okay? Let us solve this. First of all, I need to convert these so that they have rational exponents, or exponents that are fractions. Top down, bottom out, okay? What does that mean? This exponent to the x is 1. The exponent here to this x is 1. How do we know that? Because if it's not written, by default it's 1. Just like if I have a radical sign here without a root, by default, it's a square root or a 2. Okay? So top down, bottom out. The top of this fraction is the one that slid down to come with the x. That's my 1. The bottom of this fraction is the one that popped out and became the root. 3. So if I have x to the 1 third... The top just slid down, and the bottom <whistles> popped out. Top down, bottom out. So when I say top down, bottom out, that's what I mean. Some people don't care for phrases or catchy things. It helps my students remember things. If you need to, your denominator is always on the outside. Your numerator is always inside, okay? So let's take a look at the next one. Top down, bottom out. The one slid down, and the two popped out for the root. There you go. Uh, when I multiply things with common bases, don't I just add the exponents? I mean, this is so simple. One third plus one half, and
And um, don't I need a common denominator? The common denominator is 6. So this will be x to the 2 sixths plus 3 sixths. If I add those, that's 5 sixths. Okay, uh, it's time to get real here, people. If you struggle doing this basic operation, you should not be in Algebra 2 regions. But let's say for conversation's sake, you are. Your calculator will do this math for you with the fraction function. So if I go here, let's quit this. Beautiful graph. If I hit alpha y equals enter, I get a fraction, one third plus alpha y equals enter, one half. Since I used the fraction feature, it will give me an answer in a fraction if it can be represented in a fraction. Five sixths. There you go. Now look it. If the two fractions I had to combine were 413 all over 9,873 plus 11 over 217. Look, I, I get that. I get that. But one third and one half? Come on. People, easy. And we have one more problem left to do. Data. Data collected about jogging from students with two older siblings are shown in the table below. Using these data, determine whether a student with two older siblings is more likely to jog if one sibling jogs or if both siblings jog. Justify your answer. Justification just means show your math work. We do not have to explain with words. All right. Uh, what might be slightly confusing is both my columns and my rows talk about jogging. So let's decipher this. First of all, more likely means which one has a better or bigger probability. Okay? 0.5 is bigger than 0.2. So 0.5 is more likely. We need to figure out two probabilities. What probabilities do we need to figure out? I'm glad you asked. Let's go highlighter. And they say, determine whether a student with two older siblings is more likely to jog. Who's more likely to jog? So I'm going to look at students who jog in this column here. All my students that jogs, okay? But what do they want me to compare? That's the million dollar question. Which one's more likely to jog? If you, oh, highlighter again. One sibling that jogs. Okay, that's, here are all the one siblings that jog right here. Or, and I'll use a different highlighter. If both siblings jog. Here's both siblings jog, okay? There we go. So I need to compare those two columns and see what, what's going on here. All right, let's take a look at this one right here. Okay. Out of all the people who either jog or don't, so out of all the people that have one sibling that jogs, this column here, what's the probability that that person jogs? Well, 416, yep, I should put a 1 in there, out of, oh, let's add these, 9, 3, 2, is that 22, 39? Let's double check our math. We'll do 1823 plus 416. 2239. So out of those 2239, out of those 2239 people that have a sibling that jogs, 416 jog. Here we go. Okay. We got to compare that to this. If they have both siblings jog. Okay, what's that total? 0, 8, Seven, 1,780. Okay, so out of the 1,780 that have two siblings that jog, how many of those people jog as well? 400. Okay, so how do I know which one's bigger? Versus tonight on Algebra 2. I'm so sorry, that was bad. Anyways, uh, I, I put them in the calculator and I check out their decimals. Okay, so I'm going to go, yeah. And I'm going to do my first fraction that I have in green. 416 divided by 2239. That gives me uh, 0.185, all right? Let's do our other fraction in blue. 400 
divided by 1780. Yeah, see, oh, an extra, didn't put the thing there. 400 divided by 1780. That is 0.224. So, this is 0.186. It's round at three places. This is 0.225. Here's our justification, our work. We have to answer the question, which one's more likely to jog? Those people that have two siblings that jog or those siblings that only have one? The person that has one sibling, I guess. Um, this is higher. So you will say, if both siblings jog, it's more likely if both Siblings, a jog. I think the J is silent. Jogging. Okay, yeah, that was from Anchorman, but you can thank me later for that one. All right, and there you go. We're done. This one was probably a little tricky because they talk about jogging and jogging and jogging, and both the columns and the rows talk about jogging. So you really got to be careful and look at what they're asking for there. But, I mean, the rest of this wasn't that difficult at all, and I think you could have scored really, really well on this. Guess what? It's time for us to go. We have one more video for this June 2017 exam, and that is problems 32 through 37. And uh, I haven't recorded it yet, but I'm about to. And if I do record it, all you got to do is just click on the next video. And for me, maybe a week went by. But for you, just a moment, my friend. And that... It's how Einstein described relativity. See ya.